Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, we have a very special guest, attorney Paul Morantz. One of the main topics we discuss is the group Synanon, founded and ran by Charles Dieterich. The following audio is of Charles Dieterich talking over the wire to members of Synanon, threatening violence against perceived enemies of the group. After the audio of Charles Dieterich, there will be a three-hour discussion with Paul Morantz concerning his two books and his experiences assisting clients in need of help, escaping from coercive groups. This interview will only be one hour. The following two hours can be found on my YouTube channel at William Ramsey Investigates. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I keep thinking of, of, of the militant posture. Uh, militant don't tread on me something like that, that's, that's what, I think, it's, uh, I think we must do that, I think we must do that, and uh, I think the taking this kind of a posture will, will decimate our population once again. Don't have to. You 
man. And uh, we're, we're going to react to, to all aggression toward us. We either, we either think we have a good thing here or we don't. If we have a good thing here, then we're not going to permit people like my greedy lawyers to destroy it. And we're going to make certain that they don't and that their friends know about them. The preceding audio was of Charles Dieterich, founder and head of Synanon. Now on to the interview with Paul Morantz. The book that I read was Escape, My Lifelong War Against Cults, written by attorney Paul Morantz. Paul, are you there? Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, this to you know talk about this book and your life as an attorney who fought cults. I read the book over the last week. It's a, it's a fa fantastic read. Really interesting, but I would suspect much of this audience hasn't heard your name. If you could uh, give us a little background about yourself, how you got into the law, where you grew up, things like that, that would be great. Sure. But first, let me correct you that uh, I would not describe myself as being part of the anti-cult movement. Okay. A movement is actually what the book complains about, the more accurate uh, description for a cult. And if and there are and is an anti cult movement okay. and and sometimes it takes on the same characteristics of a cult, black and white thinking, um you know, the ends justify the means and led to a period of, that's sort of past now of kidnapping, deprogrammings. And I was never a part of that. Okay, I well, was I... someone who tried to educate people about the dangers of cults. Awesome. Well, I appreciate so, that clarification, but tell us, tell sure. the audience a little bit about your background, where you grew up, etc. Um, I grew up in West Los Angeles. I went to Hamilton High School. Uh, my dream was to go to USC. Um, and there I was sports editor and good friend of John McKay's and and O.J. Simpson, and it was a very fun time of life. I decided that uh, I wanted to be a writer, and I thought that's what I was going to do in life, but it was so much fun at USC. I went to law school so I could hang around another three years. You know, gotcha. This was like 1967 or 68. You know, we're still talking about, you know, the time of, you know, the revolution, you know, uh, girls and short skirts and and, and uh, it was a, just a great time to be a teenager and be young. You don't want necessarily to, to have it in quickly. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. I mean, the the law students on a campus are kind of like the big men on campus too, right? Oh, yeah. Somewhat. I mean, there was a certain group of undergraduate girls that always managed to study in the law school library. And when we walked in, we could identify them and their presence by their perfume. Gotcha. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, tell us a little bit about what happened when you graduated from USC. Did you? How did you kind of get started in these uh, cult-related cases? Well, you first have to start with, um, you know, personality. Um, to put it in contrast, in 2011, in the book you read, I was very concerned at that point about the type of movies that were being made at that time, which were centered on the bad guys as being the heroes, and worried about what effect that would have on future generations. Although it seemed, as fast as I wrote that, the movie swung back to doing movies about heroes again. But I grew up at a time in the 50s that um, he saw television, he saw John Wayne, you know, a big thing in my life was when I was nine years old, watching uh, the episodes of Davy Crockett and Walt Disney's Wild World of Color. And all those things had sort of great effects on me. And I remember seeing the Audie Murphy story. If you know who Audie Murphy is. He was is. the uh, World War II military fighter, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And so these were my heroes. And yet I never felt that I could be a Audie Murphy type or a John Wayne. And um, I certainly wasn't um, a match for Davy Crockett. 
although he was the one I admired the most because he had these principles, you know, be sure you're right and then go ahead. And so when the big thing was when Al Pacino played Serpico Mm -hmm. in the movie Serpico, I must have watched that three times, read the book, and it was, I felt that I could do that and that I probably would like doing that and that what Serpico did was he, he, it wasn't a physical, he's going out and attacking the Indians. It was, he was gathering the facts and bringing the evidence and no one could make him quit. Right. Even if he lost his girlfriend, everything, you know, and, uh, and so Serpico was sort of, uh, became my idol and it was always sort of in the back of my mind that if I was ever placed in the situation that he was and had that type of information, I would do the same thing that he would do. Gotcha. And I guess that uh, uh, the first incident, uh, when I was 26 years old and I was a public defender, we had this crazy judge, an old cannon, who was locking people up and locking me up. And um, she carried a derringer in her purse, and, and she, uh, her name was Noel Cannon. We used to call it Cannon's Law. She even made Time magazine saying that all the lawyers were intimidated uh, by her. And when she locked up one of my clients to get back at me because uh, I ran an in run appeal to get him out of jail when the investigators had actually cleared him, and she had him locked up. And at that point, I began to do investigation on her and prepare a report to show that she knew that his case had been dismissed and that he had been cleared when she locked him up. And that led to a hearing eventually in which she became the third judge in California to be removed from the bench. And, uh, and I think that that sort of cemented my personality, so to speak. Gotcha. Yeah. Then I had success in writing, and um, I'd written a story that was being published in Rolling Stone. I'd written some other stories published in the West. I had an agent, I had people wanting me to write books. Um, I was starting to work on a screenplay, and I thought this is where I wanted to go in life. Right. And uh, That was about Jan and Dean, right? Jan and Dean? Yeah, about right. Jan and Dean. Gotcha. And so then the strange thing happens is that through a Skid Row alcoholic named T.B. Renfro right. makes a phone call from Golden State Manor to a liquor store opener, liquor store operator in downtown Los Angeles. They weren't allowed, they, the Skid Row alcoholics, to use the phones, but one nurse let him make a call, and he said to the operator that uh, I'm being held prisoner here. He called my brother, and I managed to get hold of the nurse at the... At the um, at the place, and right. she confirmed to me that there was a whole series of Skid Row alcoholic people that she believed there was no reason for them to be there. It was a mental ward, and that they had been brought strangely by this man named Weldon. She had done a little investigation and found out that they arrived the same day that they left prison for drinking. Interesting. So, um, I thought they were probably there on probation. I just didn't understand it. And probation. A judge can say, instead of a jail or for a shorter jail sentence, you agree to go spend time in a nursing home. But that's still voluntary. They can still walk out. It just would mean they'd be breaking the conditions of probation and they could be sentenced. But I figured it was something that probably everyone involved didn't really understand. I wasn't really ready to think that people could kidnap Skid Row alcoholics to make money off of them. It just didn't seem like that was a, a likely thing. Right. But then the, the thing that changed, I guess, the course of my life was the next Saturday, there was a story in the LA Times. They arrested 
x-ray operator, a guy did horrible x-rays at nursing homes because he hired a hitman to assassinate the administrator of Ranchos Los Amigos. And the reason for that was is that the minister was going to testify that the uh, x-ray lab horrible guy was trying to bribe him to send certain long-term patients to certain nursing homes. Gotcha. And when I thought, wow, if that's going on in that industry, maybe I should call back that nurse again. And I would spend about uh, two and a half, three months pretty intensely researching, finding former employees at the nursing home. I finally found a bookkeeper who, for her own safety, kept copies of the payoff checks to the capper who brought the bodies gotcha. to the nursing homes gotcha. where they were being filled with thorazine. And when I finally had it all put together and knew exactly what was going on, that there was this conspiracy to kidnap Skid Row alcoholics to fill the beds so they could collect the money from Medi-Cal, Medicare, and Social Security, um, I knew that once I went down to for my one client, T.B. Renfro, to get him out, that they'd let all the others out and that they would destroy the records. So I took everything to the health department and laid it all out for them. And they said, what do you want us to do? And I said, I want you to come with me when I go to get my client out because you have the power to grab the records before they destroy them. Right. And so that was the start. And so for two and a half years, I, um, I was involved in that case. I had skid row alcoholics living in my apartment at times when their depositions were taken to make sure they stayed sober and right. sort of became their babysitter. And um, when that case was over, I was sort of a, uh, a local celebrity, uh, not a national celebrity, but a local celebrity. You know, I was known to, to the health department. I was known to the county council. I attended many hearings. And so I had a lot of people sort of believing in me. Gotcha. Um, but I thought that was my last of it. I thought, okay, I did my Serpico thing. You know, they could not make me go away. Eight law firms. You know, I battled the case and, and I exposed the nursing home industry. When T.B. Renfro, my client, died, he was on the front page of the L.A. Times as a skid row alcoholic who launched the biggest investigation into the nursing home industry in its history. So I, I felt, well, I'd done that, did that, and now go back to my writing career. And about that time, I had, Jan Dean now was being, um, you know, made to a movie in CBS, so I got my in to Hollywood, so to speak, because you can't really sell until you sold. It's kind of a hard circle, but now I had pierced it. And I met a woman that I thought I was going to marry, I had two kids, and so I saw my life as being pretty well set. And I probably was going to leave law. I wanted to sell the next screenplay or write a book. Something to just give me a little more security and confidence because I wanted to raise these kids and and marry this woman, and so I couldn't go back to, you know, writing in some apartment, you know. Oh, right. Selling magazine stories, you know, like the Rolling Stone, that did not really pay the bills, you know. Right. You know, unless you went on staff, and I don't think I would have wanted to do that. So I took a job at a law firm and, um, and was living a pretty normal life and thinking probably that that's what I wanted. Meanwhile, in 1976, I think it was, um, this woman, uh, Frances, uh, met Ed visiting from Los Angeles and Georgia. Ed worked from Western Union. Now, Western Union for all the, uh, the youth out there. This is long before 
the internet and email people sent messages, believe it or not, by Western Union. It's a, you know, long ago, um, past history, you know, it'd be like getting the original printing press. Right. But Western Union was still going in 76, and he, he fell in love with her and married her, brought her back to Los Angeles. And she had had some history of of uh, emotionalism of she broke up with a boyfriend and now she lost a job and she was having unfounded fears about her her husband and uh, he might want to leave her that she wasn't holding up the marriage she had unfounded fears that something bad was happening to her parents she was becoming moot and sitting in a chair while they're all watching Laker game, tears are rolling down her cheeks. And Ed decided to take her to the UCLA neuropsychiatric the next day when he got off work. But in the morning, he dropped her off at Venice Family Planning Center to see if she could get a tranquilizer. Venice does not... Uh, apply tranquilizers is a strictly birth control advice and the person there husband was a donor lawyer at the Synanon and he said uh, she said why don't you go to Synanon maybe they can help you okay. and she took a taxi cab ride and as she said going up the steps that someone said to her don't go in there you'll never come out but she went in, and she went upstairs, and she answered a few questions. Do you want Synanon's help? Yes. You know, will you do what we said? Yes. And then they came up, and they, she had waist-long hair, and they shaved it all off, bald. Wow. And then they took her by the wrist into an apartment across the street, and the next morning put her in a bus to Marin County. Right. When she'd ask for her husband, they would say, uh... Well, he knows where you are. He obviously doesn't love you. You're, we're your family now. Meanwhile, they called the husband. And he was coming down there, and he was being told he wouldn't be allowed to see her. And males gathered around the desk and sort of pushed him out. And uh, he then began writing letters to the president, to the press, to senators, went to the police, everyone and couldn't believe it that he's not allowed to see his wife. And she walked into and the she walked into the original Synanon Center. That's the Del Mar, Del Mar. Hotel. Uh, the Del Mar Hotel, just for people who don't know, is a big building that uh, housed Synanon just south of the Santa Monica Pier in downtown Santa Monica, right by the ocean. Just wanted to get that. Yeah, it was, I think, built in the 1920s or something like that. And it was a... Actually, during World War II, it was taken over as a as a military headquarters, and then after the war ended, it went back to becoming a, an elite club for for the young and rich to go to on the beach of Santa Monica. You know, young stockbrokers and attorneys and professional people, and uh, but it wasn't making enough money, and Sinon was able to purchase it in '67. Gotcha. So, so this woman it, was taken to, she was taken up to there, another Synanon, and that's S-Y-N-A-N-O-N. -N. Their yeah, place in somewhere Rank, in Marin County. County. Right, right, gotcha. Right. It was a much bigger facility. They were building a city in the, in Marin County. So uh, Ed uh, ran into a former girlfriend accompanied by her current boyfriend, and he told the story, and the, her current boyfriend said, you know, I had a neighbor who got all these guys out of skids, out of nursing homes, and maybe he can get your wife out of Sinanon, and gave him my number. Gotcha. And so when I came in that next Monday, after spending a weekend with my woman and the kids, there was a phone call that Edwin called. And I telephoned him, and he started crying. He was just crying his eyes out. And somewhere in, in all the tears, I said, I said, stop crying. I'll get her back. 
I guarantee it. And, and that uh, was the start. so that was the start. Can you talk a little bit about Synanon, the organization itself, and the kind of the head person uh, who started Synanon, Charles Dieterich? How much detail do you want? Well, I mean, just uh, the audience, I suspect, I didn't know anything about Synanon before I uh, had read the book. I knew a little bit about it through you know, its offshoots. But I at, really at, one time, at one time, I suggested when the people were talking about making a documentary to call it the, the cult that time has forgotten. I see. It's amazing to me. It's like, of course, I meet people who don't know who Patty Hearst was. So, but it still amazes me that uh, how fast and on has because it was a big story. It was a really big story. It occupied the the headlines of newspapers and magazine features from its conception, fifty eight to its end in nineteen ninety one. You know, right, for did... one period of time uh, when they tried to kill me, it was the biggest story in the country. Wasn't Sinanon like a massive landowner? They owned tons of property in Santa Monica. Isn't that they true? were the biggest land. They were the biggest landowner, Santa Monica landowner. Gotcha. And they were worth in the seventies about thirty-three million, which just you know, Jonestown was, was by comparison, I think, was six million. Gotcha. You know, and of course, Jonestown occurred uh, six weeks after Sinanon. Yet history has gone on to always uh, repeat and tell the story of Jonestown, but Synanon was actually far more dangerous. Jonestown erupted within and exploded with the mass of suicide, which has happened many times in history. You know, it was to happen, you know, after Jonestown. What Synanon was is that they developed a hit squad that went out and attacked people from the west coast to the east coast. There were three attempted murders, and from their own documents, I'm able to put together about 88 uh, beatings, physical contacts. And it was and it was an organization that had political connections. Um, you know, Dietrich was offered, and his wife were offered post by our current governor, and um, back when his first time he was governor in the 70s, right. and he was, you know, the subject of four or five books. They, they made a motion picture on sitting on Columbia Studios with uh, Edmund O'Brien playing Charles Diedrich, you know, the founder. Talk, talk a little bit about Diedrich and what, you know, not just the Imperial Marines, but what they kind of instituted and what they believed uh, right. they could do for the individual. Well, let me say something about, just a comment about what people believe. In destructive cults, and it's defined as destructive cults, is generally where the people are the servants of the organization rather than the organization existing to serve its members. And usually the leader is sociopathic and has no uh, problem uh, controlling people's lives and directing them to do their bidding. Now, the way that they get them to do their bidding is that they create a belief system or a set of beliefs or change it and then convince the followers, and that's the motivation, or the care of the stick. But in, in 95 or more percent of the time, the leader doesn't actually believe the beliefs. He's just creating them as a sales pitch. You know, and I would apply that to every case that uh, that I know of. So and That was interesting that in your book you stated that even though the cults changed, you felt like you were fighting the same person. You yeah, know? yeah, that's true. I felt like I was fighting the same personality over and over again, whether his name was Charles Diedrich, Warner Earhart, L. Ron Hubbard, um... I so uh, my can, concerns today are over the future, uh, you know, president-elect. Um, the the same kind of Dietrich, person, you know, personality traits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, a lot of things the president-elect said, I think, come out of the mouths of um, of cult leaders. 
including saying I have a movement, you know, I will, you know, bring back waterboarding and, and a lot more. And uh, I want to hold rallies where everyone comes out and cheers me. These are, you know, things. That well, those are similar concern. to the things that Dieterich did in Synanon, right? Didn't he have, like, attack groups and he used to it's, speak it's, over the wire or something? Can you talk about it's, that? It's consistent with George Orwell's predictions and it's consistent with um, with Nazi Germany. Um, yeah, I would say the first thing to explain about Dietrich is his childhood. Uh, he was born in, in Toledo, Ohio. His father was a salesman, and his mother was a uh, stage pianist. They were upper middle class, probably, um, and but the father died when he was four in a uh, automobile accident drunk. And his mother made Chuck the favorite of the uh, three kids that she had. And she was the oldest. And, uh, and he was sort of at a very early age made into the man of the family. And four years later, his youngest brother dies of the flu. You know, we're talking about a time in which you know, they didn't have the, you know, the drugs that we have today. The flus were like epidemics, wiping out millions of kids. And, but when he was 12, his mother remarried a very rich man in Toledo, and Dietrich became jealous that his role as the leader of the house was taken from him. And by that time, he started to drink, you know, rebel rouse and, had a sort of a life as a uh, party person to be the opposite of his father-in-law who was conservative and religious and financially successful. Chuck tried Notre Dame and flunked out, flunked out elsewhere, and finally gets a job um, for the uh, uh, Standard Oil Company, and he... um, Gulf Oil, excuse me, and he um, becomes a salesman for them and has some success, marries, he has a son, and uh, but he's just becoming more and more of a drunk. She finally throws him out of the house, and he decides to go to California and be a beach bum. When he arrives in California, he ends up working for Hughes Tool, and um, and find his way when he he marries a second time and that one ends marriage the way the first one does he's just too drunk and she's had enough and uh, uh, he had a daughter in the second marriage after they divorced uh, the second wife's uh, new boyfriend uh, when she broke up with him shot her, killed her in front of uh, Chuck's daughter, J.D. Oh, wow. So J.D. ends up coming in to sit on, and she will become later the their successor. Gotcha. Um, when Dietrich became an AA fanatic and rose within AA, he volunteered for a an experiment that was being done to see whether or not a new drug might help alcoholics stop drinking. And the drug was LSD. And Diedrich took it and had this great experience where he believed that he saw the world as it is. There was no good. There's no bad. It just is. And went through a period of reading philosophy books, psychology books, and then began to speak in those tones at AA instead of the normal religious tones. And he developed the following that would come to his apartment after the AA meetings, and they would enter into a circle and play what would later become called the game. And the idea was you can scream and attack anyone's behavior, and you don't even have to be telling the truth. You can say anything you want to have a cause and effect. And... Um, a couple addicts came around and were allowed to participate. AA in those days did not allow addicts 
in because of beliefs that could not be cured, and they would just rob and steal. And these addicts stopped shooting while they were there, although later they would go back to it. And more and more addicts came around. The alcoholic people didn't want them. And AA said they can't come to meetings. And so Diedrich stood up at AA and you know, accused them of bigotry and everything. He made his decision. And his decision was, well, you got AA for the alcoholics, but there's no one for the addicts. So he tossed out the alcoholics and kept the addicts. And at first, it was just a small storefront in Venice called the uh, uh, Tender Loving Care Club. Right. But when they found the name was um, was taken, when they finally incorporated in '58, uh, someone had smeared the word for their games. They were called Rural Synodons at the time, and uh, actually, they were called seminars or symposiums, and Someone slurred the word together and got thrown on. Gotcha. And Diedrich spelled it in the sand and the beach, played with the words, and then he said it would look good on the trucks. And so in 1958, Synanon was born. And, they, and Diederich said it would one day be bigger than Coca-Cola, right? Right, right. And a lot of people thought that, you know, this was finally the birth of Camelot. And in some sense it was. I mean, Synanon was was actually in in this history of quest for utopia it maybe got closer than most interesting you know it got to the tip but you know it's like if you read George Orwell or if you believe in his philosophies mankind could never create utopia because he's too flawed and in the end it will Humble. Yeah. And that that's kind of how it played out in Synanon. I mean, even though they attracted people like Leonard Nimoy, Robert Wagner, they had their own kind of strange kind of doctrines and uh, phrases that they used for their stuff. They, you know, talked about... Every, every, every cult does. Every cult makes its own language, you know, whether or not it's Scientology, Synanon, Moonies, and Lifton... Dr. Robert J. Lifton, in his book on on the brainwashing of the prisoners' of war, said that um, that everyone thinks they're becoming smarter because they're learning these new phrases and these new words. But he says it's actually reducing your capacity to think because your language is being reduced to small phrases. Right. Gotcha. And to repeating small phrases, so you're actually not, it's, it's the language of non-think. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, all those phrases and terms. and the, I mean, he was basically like a human potential. It became a human potential movement, right, from kind of drug yes, rehab. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, I could go on for a long time about Maslow, you know, who was sort of the creator of all this. But he sit it on just copied as it went along sort of whatever was popular at the time. So in the 50s, it was, you had the coffee houses and uh, the beatniks. And so the image of Synodon was a coffee house and where people played bongos. And uh, so Hollywood sort of discovered it. You know, Charles Nelson, I guess had Natalie Wood, you know, Lucille Ball. Everyone was coming down, Steve Allen, because uh, they wanted... Sort of an escapism, they thought, from, if anything, from the phoniness of Hollywood. Synanon was real. People talked, you know, supposedly, you know, about real problems and the problems they had growing up, and um, it was very attractive. The amount of non addicts who would come to their Saturday night parties um, and donate money just kept growing and growing, and Synanon became more and more famous. And then it just kind of went sour. I mean, you talked about the Imperial Marines. You talked about some of their strange stuff. Well, it's a lot. So it's a lot slower process than that. You know, it's in my other book, Miracles of Madness. You know, I only tell the story of Sinan. You know, it's like it's a huge book, six hundred and seventy pages, and it's meant to be the most complete study of one group that you'll ever see. 
I had every newspaper ever written on Sudanon. I had all their inner memos. I had tape recordings of Deidre. And I was able to put together this amazing story in history. But it was, you know, first the addicts began to to use the language of the street, you know, you know, the swear words, and they were allowed in the game so you could, you know, attack people. You were not allowed to commit violence, and you were not allowed to threaten violence. The belief was that that would stop people from speaking. And then the also, if there was violence, that the police were waiting to to tear them down. Sunan was born in controversy. Uh, you had a, a, a group of criminologists, criminologists like uh, Louis Yablonsky and different people that thought it was, you know, the greatest thing in the world. And you had a senator tell John F. Kennedy that it's a miracle on the beach. Santa Monica was against it. They did not want a beacon attracting addicts from all over the country who would then fail and then, you know, occupy Santa Monica. Right. They wanted to sit on, you know, gone. And um, they arrested Diedrich for operating a hospital without a license and out of zone. At that point, he was in a National Guard armory that was located on the beach um, right on the edge of Santa Monica. And uh, Governor Brown Jr. signed a bill, excuse me, Pat Brown Sr., his father, signed a bill in 1961 that exempted Sinanon from um, health licensing under accepting the Sinanon argument that the public had failed in curing drug addicts. So keep the state out of Sinanon and let Sinanon go its own way and find its own cure. Gotcha. And that was accepted. There was a very powerful minority view that Sinanon didn't cure anybody but absorbed people and that it had cultist aspects and that one day there would be a state of mind in Sinanon that they were afraid of. Turns out that those people were the ones who had a better crystal ball. But you can't blame the people who jumped on Sinanon's wagon because they had, from the beginning, like 13, 14 people, average age, say 35, 36 years old, that had robbed banks, banks that had, you know, done stick-ups, that had, you know, been hooked on heroin since they were, you know, 15 or 14, who now were living lives that were envious. And a large part of that was that um, they had reached an age where they were tired of the streets. They had reached an age where they were ready to commit to something, to get off drugs. And then Sinanon sort of made the discovery that, um, well, one is there was hope. Because at that time, in 1958, the, the idea that you could ever cure an heroin addict was thought to be impossible. There was no hope. You know, we might as well just give him his drugs or shoot him. Gotcha. You know, uh, and uh, Sin and I had showed that, well, if you put a roof over the head, take away their problems by giving them a bed, feeding them friends, not only friends, but the people that they knew on the street that they used to shoot with are the people who are telling them, don't do it anymore, and look at me, look how I look today, and you can look like this. And so there was, uh, you know, a discovery. Right, so now, they, they were able to cure people, but how did Synanon kind of generate its month, its funds? Well, they had people donating, they had the game club, um, and then Diedrich was a pretty smart businessman making um, some uh, deals on property. The uh, uh, a gas station um, company let them buy some gas stations that they ran. But the biggest thing was they got a, uh, a stamp machine that allowed them to stamp products. So this was your your 
promotional items for big business. So you would go to, say, a Fortune 500 company and say, here, order your giveaway pens with your name stamped on it, but also stamped on it would be sent on. Right. And the message was, if you buy from us, not only do you get a tax write-off, but you save a life. And that was a pretty uh, big sales pitch, and that brought in, you know, eventually would be, they'd become the second largest uh, supplier of promotional items in the United States. All right, so it was like merchandise merch or something like that. Is what and the they all, yeah, and there were always businesses. And then, you know, as they developed more and more businesses, the changes in the Synodon came in in 66. Um, Diedrich actually saw Synodon as a failure. Um, the actual percentages of people uh, staying off drugs, no one really knew, but but from what they could piece together, it was, you know, maybe 3%, 2%. You know, it just wasn't succeeding. Gotcha. large part was they were getting younger people, a lot of people coming, you know, on the information. A lot of people came there just to get clean for a while and then leave. They didn't have the same dedicated people that they had in the beginning. And so Diedrich saw it as a failure. It's funny because I don't. You know, I think it was more successful than he thought it was. Uh, But he then began to recruit the squares. Squares were non-addicts. And he saw them as what he needed to run the businesses and to develop it into utopia and to um, create the new society. And for this, um, he developed the Synodon Trip, which was a process that I believe that Warren Earhart copied when he made the uh, the S training. The idea that you come for a weekend, you're not allowed to sleep, you know, you use a lot of meditative states, you know, people are attacked verbally, you know, shown to be, you know, that they're assholes, and the message being applied that there is hope, and that is total commitment to Synodon. And so through the the trip experience, uh, squares were then sucked into Synanon. They would turn over all their money and their wealth. And it's very interesting, both with, with uh, Jonestown, with Synanon, and a lot of these groups that started helping poor people, that really changes in them where they became so sort of crazy and violent is when the middle class started entering. Interesting. And, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It seems to be a common thing. But the people from the middle class, some of them are coming because they want the power. Gotcha. Uh, who are who are these people? They are Most of them are good people, but they're just lonely. They're unhappy. They don't particularly like freedom. They want someone to carry a big stick, a big daddy, and tell them what to do and how to live and and give them their meals and their jobs and their friends and, most of all, give them a purpose in life. Gotcha. And that is always a large part of the population at all times in history. That's why we have cults over and over and over again right. is because you have this group of people and they do live better and happier in such environments. The trick is to keep keep it from going bad. You know, well, in Synodon's case, Diedrich in 67, he said there's no more graduation. No one ever leaves. This is a, a cradle of the grave. So that's why a lot of people think that the Eagle song, Hotel California, was was that be written about Synanon? That's Even interesting. So how did how did the Eagles know how did the Eagles know about Synanon? Well, everyone knew about Synanon. Tonight, Synanon was big news. Um, and if you're if you're and also 
there's this connection between jazz and musicians and so on because those are the people who get hooked on drugs. So a lot, you know, musicians and jazz musicians went into Sinanon. But but from this period, they never came out. So that the leave was no longer um, allowed. The idea was that Sinanon was a failure and that the only way that someone stays off drugs is to stay here forever. Gotcha. What do you think that Sinanon's, so, what do you think Sinanon's peak membership was? About 1800, 2000. That was what, and, in the mid-70s? Uh, early 70s? Yeah, yeah. And what, it just uh, kept steady growing, growing each year. You know, in the 60s when he closed it, it was probably about 580, you know, something at that time. But when they build a city in Marin County where it could be a cradle of the great society, he instituted containment. And containment meant that you don't even you don't leave the facility. We have our own movie theaters, we have our own restaurants, we have our own food, all entertainment is here. You don't associate with non on people. You don't leave unless you're in a group of people that go out together. And and containment was basically the death of Sinanon. Because now in a world that's contained, you now got George Orwell's 1984. You've got the wire, the speakers, the public address system. But Diedrich is now surrounded by yes men. Nobody who will say no to him. And everyone will reinforce his any idea. And no one's having any source of information or contact other than Sinanon. Sinanon in the wire. Can you, explain, can you explain what the wire was and how that functioned? They set up speakers all throughout. They had, you know, later they built a city in, in the Badger Mountains in Visalia and then one like Avisu. And the wire was a broadcasting system. It was a radio station. And it was 24 hours, and it was in all the bedrooms, all the hallways, the bathrooms. And, you know, Dietrich could catch in with a microphone and speak any time. And then there was always a DJ who would be playing news, and they would um, play over tapes of Dietrich speaking. And eventually, the, the major conversation on the wire was the enemies and getting the enemies. Gotcha. It, it, it was 1984. Everyone says when, when 1984 arrived, they said, well, it never happened. Orwell was wrong. The fact is, is it, it happened in in 1977. Gotcha. And did, it uh, happened. It didn't, happened Sinanon. Right. Sinanon became increasingly violent for around that time, too. Is that correct? Sinan commands violence in 74. And I can tell you how, how that happened, if you want. Yeah, please do. The IRS, because of the squares moving in, began to challenge the idea that Sinan was a charity and should be getting, not have to pay taxes if they really were running businesses and supporting a lifestyle. And seeing this battle coming, um, Diedrich... And his law people, Dan Garrett, Howard Garfield, they plotted together and decided that the way to keep their tax status was to become a religion. Kind of like Scientology. And it also, uh, yeah, the same way Scientology, somewhat the same way Scientology came in. Scientology came into existence over a legal decision that said it was a fraud to make the representations that it would of all its cures, that they could only make a religious representation of belief, but not scientifically. And so Dianetics ended in Scientology. It was born. And Synanon, it was, it was, we want to not pay taxes, so we become a religion. Now, another thing that they did was, now up to this point, you remember Diedrich younger brother uh, dying of the flu and the role right. he had as a small kid. Diedrich walked away from his son 
and moved to California. He walked away from his daughter. Um, he had never shown any interest in kids. In fact, on tape recordings, you have him just basically say, he doesn't like them. And so inside Synanon, babies were taken from their mothers at six months and put in a hatchery where they would be raised by the community and parents were discouraged from ever seeing their kids. They don't belong to you. They belong to Synanon. But by now, you've had kids who had grown up and been 18, and they basically leave. And Dietrich says, well, we spend all this money feeding and raising them, and then they leave. So we don't profit from this. So why do it anymore? So and he basically orders, um, you know, uh, starts a vow of childless to have no children. But first, he says, we're going to take in the teenagers who are, are troubled and apply the Sinan system to them. And the Sinan system was to put them in the game, make them work jobs into strict punishments and a system of rewards and punishments and order to act a certain way or you will be punished. And... They then applied to juvenile departments and to the state and said, hey, don't spend your money putting these kids in juvenile hall. Send them to us, and we'll fix them. And this became known as the punk squad. And these kids were streetwise and really didn't want to be there and wanted to get back. And so the Synodon system didn't work at all. And Diedrich got frustrated. He felt they or they should be respected by these punks. And so he ordered that you could hit them in the face, kick them in the ribs, knock them to the ground, and then just put them in a game to discuss them why they got treated that way. And they even kept logs on it, which I have. I knew they beat up. And then eventually it spread to even the kids that were born there, if they acted out, they could be subject to this treatment. And then if, if a kid tried to escape, he was beaten. And if a kid tried to steal money or something to help him escape, uh, there was one kid, Clifford Zipperary, they brought him up on the stage. And four people were beating him up while it was played on the wire so that everyone could hear him screaming. Wow. Um, he just calls it a uh, carom shot that affects the behavior of one person. It spreads. And then it was people who stole from Sinan to go out and teach them a lesson. And from there, it was just a short jump to anybody who says anything bad about Sinan, anybody who does anything to harm Sinan. And then Dietrich trained the Imperial Marines as a hit force to go out and get the enemies of Sinan, which is seen as lawyers, the media, or anybody who would say or do anything against Sinan. And that's how it went from nonviolent to violent. Dietrich even announced it in a press conference in 77 that the rule of nonviolence was no more. And you got caught up yeah. in the violence, right? Yes. Okay. In the following two-hour interview, Paul Morantz discusses Sinanon's attempt to murder him and his involvement with other cults. So please go to William Ramsey Investigates on YouTube to hear the two-hour discussion with attorney Paul Morantz.